Okay, this is the third session of the decolonial dialogues which uh, Ramon uh, and I are uh, having. And in this session, we'll focus on decolonial political theory. And the way we'll do it is by looking into the actual debates that has been going on in Latin America uh, and in which Ramon is involved. So Ramon, please inform us about what the nature of that debate are the topics and the arguments, and then we'll go into what the theoretical implications of it are. Okay. Well, basically in Latin America, there's been a big debate in the past three, four years uh, inside the decolonial networks, okay? Because of the position taken by a a, a group of people, you know, that well known inside the decolonial networks in relation to uh, the anti-imperialist governments in uh, Latin America, in particular, the Venezuelan government and the Bolivian government. Uh, let's begin with the Venezuelan government. Uh, as you know, the Venezuelan government is a government uh, is known as the Bolivarian uh, Revolution. You know, that's the project they have uh, led by Hugo Chavez. And they've been, uh, it's an anti-imperialist revolution, anti-imperialist government uh, that has in a way taken the resources of Venezuela to redistribute wealth among the poor people and to improve the situation of millions of people in Venezuela. Um, and, you know, against the imperialist project uh, that is in alliance with the Venezuelan white Creole elite oligarchy. You know, there is an oligarchy in most of Latin America led by white Creole elites. Uh, and descendants of the Spaniards and Portuguese in, in, in what we call today Latin America. Um, so this government, the previous governments and the state uh, that the Chavista uh, movement inherited is a, is a capitalist, uh, modern, colonial, racist, patriarchal state led by the white Creole elites of Latin America. And so the movement of, of the Chavista movement, you know, was crucial to the struggle for recovering the wealth, you know, of Venezuela away from imperialism, away from this oligarchy. And, you know, which is also very corrupt oligarchy. Um, and, and so this posed a debate because uh, well-known people in the decolonial circles in Latin America, like for example, Aníbal Quijano, Walter Mignolo, Catherine Welsh, uh, and many people that are considered part of the left in Latin America signed a document produced by Edgardo Lander who happened to be a Venezuelan, but also well-known member of the decolonial networks in Latin America, who was repeating basically the same thesis of the imperialist and oligarchy about the Maduro and Venezuelan government. Uh, as you know, the Venezuelan government have had 25 elections in the last 20 years. It's the country with most elections probably in the world. And They've been, they have lost two elections of, of which they have recognized the loss, they have recognized the defeat. So, um, and has one of the most transparent electoral systems in the world. That's not said by the Maduro government or the Venezuelan government, that's said by the Jimmy Carter Foundation. You know, Jimmy Carter, the ex-president of the US who are always, uh, international witnesses in the electoral process of Venezuela and always say that the, the methods they have there, the, the system they have in place is very reliable. It's one of the most, if not the most reliable system in the sense that it's very difficult, almost impossible to, 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 do, to have a corrupt result because it's, 
is fiscalized by everybody, the opposition and the government. So everybody has its witness of the results in a clear way. So uh, they have a democratic government elected and reelected over time. And now after, the, after Chavez passed away, you have the Maduro being the, the new president. And the thesis of these uh, uh, documents is written by Edgardo Lander and signed by all these different, uh, you know, well-known people in the decolonial networks of Latin America, is basically saying the same thing you read in the mainstream press, in the imperialist press, that Maduro is a dictator, that the Bolivarian government is a dictatorship, that, uh, you know, that it's an authoritarian government, that, I mean, that they are uh, repressing the people and so on. And they come up, the first document they came up with was exactly at the moment when the imperialists put forward a paramilitary squads in the streets of Caracas, Venezuela, known in Venezuela as the Guarimbas, uh, which are like paramilitary groups financed by USA together with the oligarchy and the oligarchical opposition in Venezuela, uh, basically shooting at people in the streets. I was in Venezuela when this happened. I, I, I'm witness of this. I was seeing how the Chavistas were afraid of going to the streets because these people were all over the place in many corners, you know, many cor street corners, you know, doing barricades and shooting at people they identify as Chavistas. So most of the people that died were Chavistas, okay? And, and the Chavista, it was, it was a funny scenario because you could see the Chavistas hiding from, the, from these people, you know, when you have a Chavista government. Why is that so? Because Maduro refused to answer violence with violence. He didn't want to re respond to the violence of the Guarimbas, of these paramilitary groups, fascist groups, with violence, because he knew that was the way for imperialism to begin a civil war there. Sort of what happened in Syria, very similar. They were basically shooting at people, you know, and you know, uh, paramilitary groups, uh, snipers, etc. And then the response of the Assad regime was so brutal in a sense that then uh, the situation led into what the imperialists wanted, a civil war that destroyed the country. So Maduro, learning from that lesson, refused to, to, to um, answer back to these Guarimbas with violence. And uh, even though these people were shooting at them, and the, the people, he forbid the police and the soldiers from shooting back, okay? So the way they managed to, to solve the problem was through a political solution. What Maduro did was a constitutional a assembly put to the vote of the people the summer of 2017, okay? Where the opposition, so, so many people going to vote, more than the people that supported Maduro in the previous elections, that they, they were disconcerted and they, were, they, they got divided. They saw that the violence was leading nowhere, that the vote for the new Constitutional Assembly was so huge that it was a response to the violence of the, of the position and they got split and they decided not to go in this direction. I'm giving you this context for English speaking people that might not know the details because there is a lot of fake news to the point that while this violence was going on in the streets, I was there, I saw this with my eyes. And, and then when, when you go, when I, I, I left Venezuela and I went to outside Venezuela, then the mainstream press was saying that Maduro was killing the opposition in the streets. So the opposite of what was going on on the, on the ground in Venezuela. That's why you read in the press, the fake news. And so the idea was to discredit Maduro as a dictator, killing the opposition and things like this. When in fact it was these people, the opposition, the oligarchic opposition, killing people in the street. And if you happen to be Chavista and black, they will burn you alive. They burn alive several people for being ch black Chavistas, 
So these people are hyper racist, you know? So all of this was going on on the ground. While you go outside Venezuela, you read the international press saying it was Maduro killing the people, okay? It's, it's the opposite. We should give a Nobel Prize for peace to Maduro for have avoided over and over again a civil war in Venezuela because they have tried so many times. Since 2017, there have been several attempts at, ki at killing him, at uh, uh, producing a, an invasion, a military invasion, you know, et cetera, producing violent acts, and the government of Venezuela has been very successful at neutralizing this. So in the middle of this violence, here comes the so-called decolonials, you know, leading figures of decoloniality, okay, putting a document out accusing the Venezuelan government of the same thing that imperialism is accusing them. So when I saw this, I came out in public, not only me, Enrique Dussel, myself, and other people, we came out in public to, with, you know, replying, they have documents with signatures where many people of the, I call, what I call the pseudo left of Latin America sign, and we produce a, an alternative document replying to their document, also getting signatures. And also Enrique Dussel came out with a video that uh, basically went after this kind of, of arguments, you know? And, <clears throat> and so there was a big split after that <clears throat> between people who, like me, who, who assume and always say that decoloniality implies to be anti-imperialist. You cannot be decolonial and be pro-imperialist. This is the nonsense. Uh, and that decoloniality, uh, you cannot be, you know, in terms of the politics, you cannot call yourself decoloniality. And in the middle of a, an imperialist military aggression, you take side with the imperialist thesis against the victims of of imperialism. I mean, this is nonsense, you know? Uh, and, and then they produce another document in January 2019 when you have this guy Guaido, Juan Guaido, uh, also a, a guy from the oligarchic opposition supported by Trump, where he declared himself president of Venezuela in a plaza of Venezuela. I mean, this is, in Latin America, this is very well known. I don't know about other parts of the world, how much people know these details, but, but this guy supported by Trump called himself the president of Venezuela. And since then, the guy has expropriated international resources on orders by Guaido, recognized by Trump in more than you know, $30 billion of Venezuelan resources, gold, importing bank accounts, uh, cash, dollar, money in, in dollars in foreign bank accounts, Citgo, the refinery enterprise and, and gasoline uh, uh, enterprise in the US uh, that have been also expropriated under their, because they recognize Guaido as the president who have never been elected. And then he makes declaration to do this or that. And then Trump's follow it as if he was receiving orders from Guaido, when in fact it's the other way around. It's, it's Trump and, and imperialist governments you know, giving orders to, to Guaido, you know, so, and then in the middle of this, here they come, January 2019, and write another document attacking again the Venezuelan government as authoritarian, as, I mean, the same thing. So I always ask myself, for whom they work, because it's, it's funny that they come up right in the middle of, you know, moments that are crucial. To, with these documents and, and getting signatures, okay? And, and not only that, Lander and the people who signed these documents in January 2019, they met with Guaido in public. They had a meeting with Guaido. Not only that, they come out of the meeting and do a press conference and they say that Guaido is more legitimate than Nicolas Maduro, the elected, democratically elected president of Venezuela which is like, how, how could you call yourself the colonial and be doing these things? I mean, it's really very problematic. But so what, what, what I, what I, uh, I've been in Venezuela 
twice, you know, um, you have been much more times here. And uh, I know that you and I were in a demonstration that was organized around the time that the military uh, attacks on the border of Venezuela were there. And uh, we were witness of uh, and, and took part in a demonstration of about one million people. Uh, we were there at a square and saw what a popular revolution looks like. So I think that um, when you go outside of Venezuela and you see the enormous uh, mental pressure, intellectual pressure on those people outside of Venezuela and in Venezuela from the media, which is controlled by the right, then you see it's also a matter of intellectual integrity now in the decolonial movement. If you are a decolonial activist or intellectual and you want to take a stand regarding revolutions, then if you are anti-imperialist, it will directly impact your position as an activist or as uh, 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 an intellectual because the mass media will come after you. Eh? Uh, the academia will come after you because they have created this demonizing image of the dictatorship and the horrors of Venezuela. So if you want to stand up against it, it's a, a very big thing. And I think uh, it's, uh, let's say, it's a, a, also a matter of ethics in the decolonial movement. Where do you stand in the struggle of the masses? And how yes. do you react when the pressure from the media is, is the biggest? How do you react? Do you succumb or are you able to uh, uh, put up on the pressure? Uh, so I, I think you have to be among the struggling masses to understand where you stand. Yes, but you know, I'm saying these things also because many people, I mean, some of these intellectuals have important, you know, work and contributions, <clears throat> you know, and, uh, but people doesn't know their political trajectory outside Latin America. In Latin America, they're very discredited because of having taken this kind of positions all over the place, yeah. you know, basically taking a, you know, a position of the empire in the middle of conflict. Because remember, after January 2019, when you have the Guaido coup d'etat, et cetera, in Venezuela, uh, or the Atema de coup d'etat, where they came out with this document, they meet with Guaido in, you know, they say this nonsense that Guaido is more legitimate than, than Maduro when Guaido never went to an election. He just stand in a plaza and declare himself president. You know, he says self-proclaimed -pro president. So uh, how could you be the colonial say this nonsense? But anyway, 11 months later, you have the coup d'etat against Evo Morales, the government, the indigenous president of Bolivia, okay? And, Again, the same people that you saw signing those documents come out in public in the middle of a coup d'etat, okay? Many of them calling themselves decolonial, okay? Many of them calling themselves decolonial, now coming with the position that there is no such a thing as a coup d'etat against Evo Morales, that that was a popular rebellion. I mean, the white Creole elites organized white supremacist para paramilitary groups in Bolivia, and they go and take over La Paz, the capital, through violence against indigenous people in Bolivia, killing and doing all kinds of massacres, okay? These people do a coup d'etat. The Organization of American State, that Ministry of the Colonies of the USA, was central with Almagro, you know, as the president of this organization was central to say that there was a fraud in the electoral process, even though uh, Morales won cleanly the elections, okay? But they went after it by saying, <coughs> the, the, spreading the fake news that later was by many organizations, including in the US, who studied the result of the elections in Bolivia, that declared that there was no fraud, that the results were exactly the way they were declared. But, but because of this fake news of fraud spread by U.S. empires through Almagro in, the, in this ministry of colonies called the Organization of American States, uh, I'm using the concept of ministry of colonies that Fidel Castro used to characterize that organization in 1961, okay? 
when that organization expelled Cuba from the organization of American states under the orders of American imperialism, well, now the, this same organization is coming and say there's a fraud in the election. Then immediately the, it was used as an excuse to do a coup d'etat, the, the, the basically white supremacist paramilitary groups in Bolivia. And, and so they take over, destroy the democratic process. They did a lot of massacres in a year. Now, as you know, the result of the elections in Bolivia, uh, the movement of Evo Morales won the election 55% and the second candidate who was the second also in the previous election, got 28% of the vote. So it's a huge gap. So it shows that there was no fraud. That was, that, that it was a clean election last year, but in the 11 months they've been in power, you don't know how many things they've done in terms of destruction of the economy, in terms of corruption, in terms of mafia deals with drugs in Bolivia, in terms of killing and massacres of indigenous people. You, you, you have no idea, but anyway, I don't want to go that way because it will take us away from the topic. The point is that last year, in the middle of the coup d'etat, the same people that came in public against the government of Venezuela in the middle of the Guaido coup d'etat in January 2019, 11 months later, do the same thing with Evo Morales. Worse, they will say there is no such a thing as a coup d'etat or a popular rebellion. They will question the idea of a coup d'etat. They will say that that's just a hypothesis, that that's not real. I mean, they will say all kind of nonsense. These are the people who call themselves anti-colonial, decolonial, you name it, okay? The same people. So you ask yourself, what is going on with these people? How come people that are intelligent, that have made great contributions intellectually in their work, could end up in this corrupt kind of politics? But how, you know, how in, can they, in, what, what is their intellectual contribution? if they cannot understand that decolonial is in a sense anti-imperialism. How can you be decolonial and for well, some of them, okay, okay, some of them, if you have, if you, read, if you are fluent in Spanish, you could read some of their work. Some of them have done, have done good work in terms of history, you know, right. in, 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 you know, decolonial history. Okay, okay. Uh, some of them have good work in terms of decolonizing knowledge All and right. so okay. on. But then when it comes <clears> to <throat> the politics, so they become like, it's kind of academics, intellectuals that don't understand politics. Here is where I want to go. I want to go into the problem. What are the intellectual problems mm -hmm. that lead these people to fall into these traps, okay? Because I don't want to say, oh, they are just, oh, they're traitors. No, no, you do okay, that, you, you lost sight of the lessons that we need to learn from these kind of things. Okay. We cannot say they are traitors or these are people that just, you know, and no, just leave it so like they, that. They made intellectual contributions, not in terms of practical politics, but in terms of, let's say, history, knowledge production. Okay, that I can understand. Yeah, no, so that kind of thing. You can, you can you make see, contributions on that. I understand. Yes, but for me, do, do you, the decolonial project is a political project of social trans and political transformation of the world. If not, we turn the colonial into another uh, academic fad and academic uh, fashion. You see, but and I think here you see the problem of the colonial uh, uh, intellectuals in the academia. The academia is a center of knowledge production, but functions under the discipline of the ideological supremacy and hegemony of. Of, of the media and of the, of the yes. right forces. That is how it functions. So as long as you have theories that doesn't touch on the practical political implications, you can be decolonial. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but once, absolutely. It comes, this is... once it comes to the practical conclusions, then you're in the midst of social struggle and then you have to, to take sides. Where are you? Yes. Social struggle. And mm -hmm. then, the site you take has practical implications for yes. the position in the academia because yeah. the, 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 the media will, will, will ring you as a professor when you are saying, look, you know, Maduro has done a great job. 
you know, you, you, you will be intellectually killed there. And that's the pressure. Yes, what it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a fine line between conviction and convenience. Yeah. And so a lot of these people want, I want to go into this detail. I want to go now into why, why you have people falling into these traps, okay? And I want to go into the conceptual framework that leads them there, okay? Okay, let's, let's begin, because I want to go into the, the concept of the state, mm -hmm. the concept of uh, how they see the question of extractivism, uh, the question about feminism, and the question about politics. Okay, okay. I want to go into these four areas. Okay. Let's begin with the concept of the state. What is common to these people <clears throat> is the idea that the state, they are anti-status, you know, anti-state in a, in a, I would say in a delusional way. They think that any radical movement has to get rid of the state tonight. Many of them are close to anarchism, if not openly anarchist. You could see that already in the world of Quijano. Quijano was radically anti-state. Anything that had to do with the state for him was already reactionary. And the problem with that is that you cannot make disappear the state tonight. We are in a world, in a sense, the Chavista government, for example, anti-imperialist government, inherit state structures that are not of their creation. Mm -hmm. and and the way the Chavistas face this, they try to escape the dilemma, which is an old dilemma in Latin America, between the people who believe like 20th century socialism, that all the solutions come from the state and take a, a state, statist kind of solution to the problems of the world. And it's a top down kind of structure. And then the anarchists, who say, we don't need the state, get rid of the state, and then we construct the new society house without a state. Today, tonight, okay? Now, this split is a, is a dualistic debate in Latin America, in my opinion, but not only Latin America. In the 20th century socialism or left, it was a big debate worldwide. And it was a very Eurocentric debate because it was posing the issues and the problems in terms of the European left, okay? How the European left conceive uh, the question of the state. And it was split between the pro-state, anti-state, you know, division. You could see that from the 19th century in the split of the first international, okay? And you could see that from there on, until today. I mean, <clears throat> this is a, a classical debate. Now, Hugo Chavez, a thinker from the Global South, came up with a different solution to this, which I find it very decolonial. He was saying, the state, the modern state, is a modern capitalist, racist, patriarchal state. It's a problem, okay? Now, if we don't occupy the state, the right wing will occupy the state. And if, if they occupy the state, we'll be in a very weak position to do any kind of social transformation. So we need to occupy the state, knowing the limits of that state, to interrupt the politics of domination coming from that state. That is politics such as neoliberalism, politics such as inequalities in the society, to, to try to do as much as possible policies within that structure that will benefit the people, okay? But at the same time, he said, we cannot be naive and think that that state with the structure <clears throat> that we have inherited, which is a modern oligarchical, you know, white patriarchal state, okay? A capitalist, neo-colonial, pro-imperial state, so we inherit the structure of that state and are we going to make a new society from there? He said, no, we're not going to construct a new society from there. The new society, we need to build it from outside that state. That is, we need to create what he called the communal power. That is people organizing in communes, 
commune-like form of political authority and economy. And of course he said, it will be delusional for us to, to think that we can get rid of this modern state that we inherited with all its problems tonight. It will be the horizon, it's the communal power, but that will take a long process in which we'll be slowly in a process of the communal power replacing the decision-making of the state by the people themselves through these communal-like forms of political authority. Okay. So that was the vision of Hugo Chavez. And, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, let, let, let me yeah. come in here, Ramon. Because as you explain this, I, I see the weakness of decolonial theory. Decolonial theory is very young, new techniques, right? Yes. And the weakness is decolonial theory. As we discussed in the first session, the background of the rise of decolonial theory has also to do with the decline of Marxism as the theory of liberation. But Marxism had a very strong theory on the state. And yes. by losing that a legacy of Marxism, you see that the decolonial theory doesn't understand. Marxism said the state is class in nature. You know, the character of the state is a class state. So then they came up with a solution. And Marx took the solution from the Paris Commune. You know, in, in the, the few months that the Paris Commune existed in 1871, um, where they had to run Paris after this revolution. So uh, how are the elements of the states, which is uh, the, the legislative branch, the execu exec executive branch, the military, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the judicial system, how, is, how would it operate under a new system? And because we discarded Marxism from the decolonity, not we, but, you know, if you throw everything out that is valuable in Marxism, then you, you become an anarchist because you leave out the whole theory. You don't have another theory that you become anti-state because you don't see the nature of the state, whether it's a class yes. nature. And in our, our concept, I would argue, the state is a colonial state. You know? The state is a colonial state in the sense that it has all the uh, uh, characteristic uh, that formed uh, the state which is, for example, in the army, it's not only the, the organizational structure, it's the mindset of the soldiers, it's the mindset of the generals, it's the colonizing of the mind, which uh, 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 tells you how to organize a state like that. I remember when I was in Venezuela, uh, I got uh, you know, uh, acquainted with the militias were forming and, and uh, uh, the people were so uh, gracious enough to to uh, bring me in contact. And one of the women who were leading these militias was putting the idea forward of decolonizing the mind and arguing that we need to change our mind if we want to change the structures <coughs> of the uh, armed forces. Uh, so I think that if you don't have a theory of the state, naturally you become anarchist and anti-state and therefore it doesn't matter whether it's a state in a revolution, a state in a capitalist society, any state is wrong. Yes, and this is why is this, is what makes, yeah, this is what makes these people react automatically and be against any kind of a movement that occupies the state. You see, immediately they react as, oh, this is reactionary, we're against the state. But the problem is that the, and here is where Hugo Chavez make a great contribution. He was saying, listen, that state is modern, it's, it's, it has all this problem, but we need to overcome that state in the long run. We cannot overcome it tonight. It's impossible. So we need to occupy it so that the right wing Okay, so, uh, so Chavez basically uh, have a different view about the state because what happened with many of these people is that 
they fall into the anti-state position because they think that if you occupy the state or you have anything to do with the state, you are immediately betraying the movement because they think that the state is bad and, and you know, and that's it. They don't, they're not seeing the problem that you cannot get rid of the state tonight. The, the state is a, a long-term structure that you cannot just get rid of it. So it will take a long process to really make it transform it into a different form of political authority. So this is where Hugo Chavez said, if we don't occupy the state, the right wing will occupy the state and you won't be able to do anything outside the state to create a new society. So he was calling for the commune forms of political authority and economy that in the long run will replace the state knowing that today you cannot replace it. But from today, you can begin to construct that, those commune uh, uh, organizations, you know, of the civil society outside the state. So he was saying, let's occupy the state to interrupt the policies of domination, including neoliberalism. At the same time, from the state, we empower the people from outside the state who are struggling against the state. So it's a, it looks like a contradiction, but it's not. It's, you need to, you put the question of time here. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very complementary thing because it's the understanding that in terms of time, you need a, a long process to really replace that state with something else. What will happen if today, all this movement like in Bolivia or in Venezuela, they decide not to you know, contest the state, leave the state in the hands of the oligarchy and imperialism, what kind of struggle are you going to develop? This is what happened, for example, in a country like Colombia. Colombia is not mentioned in the mainstream press except to praise it. But if, if someone who, anybody who knows about Colombia knows very well that this is a narco-political state. It's a state dominated by, by oligarchy who are tied to mafia, drug deals, and drug air exports, and US imperialism. The US imperialism support them. <clears throat> and they are killing people every day. For example, a lot of the people killed are people, leaders of the social movements, killed every single day. This is happening in silence in the, in the world international arena. In, in Latin America, we know because there are alternative media reporting this, but they're killing the leaders of the social movements of community leaders, you know, every single day. And this is a state policy of genocide of the people who are struggling. And this is, uh, and nobody mentions this, okay? Venezuela is the, the dictator, <laughs> the ones killing people in the streets and, and so on. And then this is happening next door and nobody says that. Not only that, Colombia is the, 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 the springboard of the aggression against Venezuela. They have 13 US military bases on the border of Venezuela from Colombia and they are the ones orchestrating a lot of these military attacks and invasions to Colombia in the last year, okay? Now, uh, try to organize a commune in any rural area of, or urban area of Colombia. The question in Colombia is not how long that commune will last. The question is how long the communers, the people doing the, the commune, are going to last alive? That's the question in Colombia. They will be killed in a second by paramilitary forces and allies of the, of the uh, branch of the military of the Colombian state. They will be killed in a second. You know, in, in, in Venezuela, the people are able to organize commune-like forms of political organization and economy in the urban and rural areas because uh, the state is occupied by the Chavista uh, Bolivarian uh, uh, forces who are encouraging this to happen, you know? So this is very important to, to say because here you have a decolonial solution coming from uh, Hugo Chavez thought and coming from the Bolivarian revolution to this old Eurocentric dilemma between pro-state, anti-state division of the left since the 19th century, where he's going beyond this dilemma and saying, no, no, we, we need to go in both directions. 
at the same time. So here you have a movement in, I want to cite a movement in Pobladores movement in uh, uh, Chile, who have a, a slogan that is not just a slogan, it's a, it's a vision, it's a political theory, where they say, uh, against the state, from the state, and outside the state. So they're saying, we're struggling against the state, we're struggling from inside the state, and we're struggling from outside the state, okay? So he's, they're saying, we need our struggle have to go in the three directions at the same time. We need to struggle against that state because it's oligarchical, it's imperialist, it's neocolonial. We need to occupy the state, that is, <laughs> do a struggle inside to occupy the state and interrupt the, the politics of domination and neoliberal policies. And we need to do a struggle from outside the state where we're going to construct the alternative to that state. So this is the same idea as Hugo Chavez, but it's coined by a social movement in uh, Chile, Pobladores movement, which is a squatter movement. They take land, you know, they build communities, they, you know, take land away from landowners and stuff like that to build communities uh, from below. And they have a, a, a political party called Partido Igualdad, Equality Party, that is the party that basically uh, intervene with, with it from within the state. And, and so this is a struggle that they don't see as either this or that. They see like, we need to fight in the three fronts at the same time. We cannot abandon any of these fronts because in the moment we abandon one of them, then you fall into problems. So you need to fight the state, you need to occupy the state, and you need to build from outside the state the new society. Now, okay, but then, then you have to put the question uh, also on the table of what is the role of the state in the transformation of a society? So yeah, here, uh, yeah. and, and let's, let's take it uh, uh, back in the, in the social movements, and, and, uh, in the national liberation movements and in the uh, socialist movement that the state, either you destroy the state, like in the Russian revolution, and build new institutions like the Soviets, or if, and that is only possible when you have an armed insurrection that destroys the army, that destroys the government, and you uh, get the government out of the <clears throat> insurrection and supported by the Soviets, or if you have a guerrilla war, you know, the guerrilla army liberates parts of the country, puts out administrative st structures there, and out of those administrative structures arise a new state. But if you get political power through elections in a parliamentary democracy, then the state you inherit is the old state, right? That is what you have. So, and then the question is, is it then possible to have such a transformation of that state uh, to such an extent, and how would this transformation look like, that the state is not the neutral thing you think it was in the parliamentary elections, but it comes to decolonial state. Take, take one example, uh, which is the army. If you take over through the elections, the administrative branch, uh, and you haven't taken over and the security uh, 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 services, uh, police and army are still controlled by uh, uh, imperialism <clears throat> through their training programs, then sooner or later, out of those sectors, a coup the time will arise when you try to transform uh, uh, society. And that is what we've seen in Bolivia, and we've seen it also in, in Venezuela, when the coup against Ujo Chavez took place, see? So that means that you have to have a policy of how to transform the armed forces, police, security service, etc. And that goes also for the, 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 the judicial branch, uh, the economics, etc. So you need to have a theory of the, 
the the state not only as something that has uh, to be changed in uh, uh, decades later and replaced by something others, but you have to have a theory of how the state can be an instrument in social uh, transformation. See? Yes. And the idea. If, of if you are anti-state, you don't think about these things. Yeah, of course. And the idea of occupying the state is precisely the idea of, for example, Hugo Chavez did a new constitution. Okay, he put forward a new constitution, transforming the old constitution to empower people. He, he <clears throat> took over resources from the oil industry to improve the life of the people, education, health, a standard of living, a program of social housing that you have almost one, two thirds of the population living in social housing now in good, good, you know, uh, houses, uh, good quality houses, I mean. Uh, and you have things like this happening uh, and you have the construction of communities that are self-building their own houses also uh, with resources from the state. And uh, so he's trying, you know, he's instrumentalized the state to the benefit of the people and but at the same time knowing the limits of that state and knowing that you need to build from outside the state you see now when it's an armed struggle of course the process will go in a different way because maybe you can build institutions um, that are uh, how can i say less dependent on the old state but still in a in an armed struggle still you're still inheriting structures, mentalities, etc., mm -hmm. from the old state. Sure. And that's why, for example, in the Russian Revolution, they had to rely on many of the bureaucrats of the Zari state, okay, to do certain things in the in the state in the new state. Mm -hmm. And even in the army, you know, they have mm -hmm. they have to in incorporate some people who were part of the ancient army, you know, of the Tsarist government, you know, to to help them out with some of the technicalities, you know. Uh, so it's not an easy thing, even if you do arm struggle and you smash the state, sure. to just build from zero. You're going sure. to build, always build from what was there before. Sure. And then you need to know how do you go from where you are now to where you want to get there. For that, I invite <laughs> you people to read the work of Enrique Dussel, his work on politics of liberation, where he puts together the question about you know, the factibility of politics and the way to go about where, from where you are now, he puts conceptual tools, okay? Uh, to think about how to go from where you are now to where you wanna go, the horizon of politics, which is you always have to have a horizon, but you also have to have some kind of conceptual pragmatic notion of politics about how you go from where you are today to where you wanna be. So politics have to have both aspects, so the horizon, the decolonial horizon, transmodern horizon beyond modernity, beyond this civilization, the foundation of a new civilization, but then the, the pragmatics of politics, why you go from where you are today to that ultimate goal in the long term, you see? So, so this is something that I invite people to read, but the point is that, uh, uh, the, the, these people basically abandon the discussion of the state. The state have, we need to do a, a conceptual <clears throat> analysis of the state that goes beyond also the Marxist analysis in the sense that we have to also place the state, the modern state, as part of the modern civilization, which is modern and colonial at the same time. So we need to put together how these forms of state that is usually called the nation state is a structural domination of Western civilization that we have inherited and we have absorbed, you know, by the colonization of the mind and also by inheritance of those structures. We have inherited that everywhere around the world and we need to decolonize from that and create a, a form of state that will be decolonial, a form of political authority that will be decolonial. But that process is a long process. The second point I want to mention about this group of people, why they, they end up where they end up, you know, uh, in complicity with imperialism, is the question about extractivism. We are all anti-extractivists, okay? We, are, we, we want a world in the future where extractivist industry can be overcome because extractivism 
has been an industry that is destructive of life and the ecology of the planet for a long time. I mean, for we have now 500 years of the ecological destruction of the world with uh, uh, the use of extractivist industry by Western colonial powers all over the world at a planetary level, you know, and these industries have proved to be very destructive of the ecology of the planet. For many reasons, we don't have time to develop now, but uh, so they take a position, a, a, a delusional, anti radical anti-extractivist position. So for example, if a government like Chavez, you know, they continue exporting oil and they don't abolish oil tonight, then they say these people are reactionary because they're reproducing the same, you know, extractivist <clears throat> industry of imperialism and they're destroying ecology and and they, they say the same thing of Evo Morales. Evo Morales. They, they even went as far as spreading fake news in the elections of last year, uh, where they said Evo Morales burned the Amazon. I mean, they were saying this thing in the middle of the elections last year. These were fake news. We know that there is big responsibility in the, uh, uh, in the fires in the Amazon last year, where was uh, the Bolsonaro government, who was encouraging the burning of, of this in order to, to to kill the indigenous communities in order for the landlords to take over the land of the Amazons for their projects, you know? So, but they were blaming Evo Morales. I mean, crazy stuff. And, and then uh, uh, because the government of Evo Morales, the government of uh, uh, Chavez are using the extractivist industry they inherited, okay? They're being accused immediately of being you know, reactionary, pro-imperialist, pro, and immediately they start attacking them, okay? Now, here is a problem, which is that the same way you inherit the modern state and you cannot just, you know, get rid of it, even through armed struggle, you still inherit structures of that previous state, even, you know, that you have to deal with, the same way you cannot just, an economy that is highly dependent on one or two export products, in the case of Venezuela, oil, in the case of Bolivia, gas. You cannot just get rid of it just at will. Like tonight we abolish oil exports. Imagine what happened, what, what will happen with the economy in Venezuela. Now, the Chavistas and Evo Morales did not create the dependency of, you know, an extractivist a commodity export, okay, such as gas or oil, you know, in the economy of Bolivia and Venezuela. That was a creation of imperialism. That was a creation of the relationship of the capitalist international <clears throat> division of labor. I mean, that, that was not a creation of them. They inherit that. Now, how do you go from there to a diversified economy? That's also a long process. You cannot just you know, a, a jump over the reality of the extractivist industry, abolish it tonight, and then what do you have instead? You have nothing because your economy, you inherit, has been, it's a neo-colonial imperialist capitalist economy that have been assigned to do X or Y for the international division of labor, and then suddenly they're saying, oh, you're reactionary because you are doing ecological destruction because you are still in the, I'm sorry, but also, this is delusional. This is, yeah. this is you, if you do question. that, uh -huh. it's also a matter of lack of imagination. You do that to finish. You, it's also a lack of imagination. Yeah, because if you do that, you will have next day. <clears throat> yeah, if you let the, the economy collapse like that, you will have next day there imperialism taking over those economies. You know, Venezuela have the largest oil. Uh, uh, oil resources in the world. That's why U.S. imperialism is so eager to destroy the Bolivarian Revolution. They want to take over those oil fields, you know? And, and, the, and the Bolivarian government, as well as the Evo Morales government, they have as a project in the long term to, to diversify the economy and replace the dependency towards this extractivist industry, knowing that in the long run, this kind of industry is going to, 
to, to, to disappear, you know, because it has limits in how far can you go with this and knowing also the consequences that it has for life in planet Earth. So they were doing a process, slow process of diversification, but then you face the problem of sanctions, mm -hmm. imperialist sanctions, imperialist blockade, imperialist economic and military war. Then what are you going to do now? I mean, how, how far can you go, you know, in terms of uh, these things? So I'm saying this because it's not an easy thing. It would take 30, 40 years for any economy to just do the transition, you know, from one, you know, from where they were to where they want to go. It would take several decades. It's not something you can do in, in 10, 20 years. And like, this is where, like, like and especially when you are under a, a military <clears throat> imperialist aggression and economic aggression. So I'm saying this because you need to, to also bring in a concept used by Dussel, the factibility of politics. That is, you need to also understand within a certain context, what kind of things, you know, what is, what is uh, able that you can do in certain contexts and things you cannot do. Like, you cannot abolish the state tonight and you cannot abolish extractivism tonight because the, the whole thing will collapse. So you need to, in a sense, uh, move forward in a, in a long term with a horizon where you want to go from where you are at and, and do the transition in a way that you can then overcome the problems that you inherited from the past. Mm -hmm. But you try to overcome that tonight <clears throat> by abolishing these things, it's just going to play in the hands of imperialism. Mm -hmm. So they come with Olympic critiques like this, you know, like they, in, and what I say is that in their hyper radicalism, of being anti-state, being anti-extractivist, calling for abolishing, you know, extractivist industry tonight, calling for abolishing the state tonight, and so on. They are hyper-conservative and right-wingers. Why I'm saying that? Because what you're doing is moral critique. You're not doing political critique. What you're doing is moral critique. You stand yourself in the Olympus mountain from where you judge the world, from your, you know, ideal, the off to be ideal of what we should be. And then you judge everybody as wrong except yourself. That is everybody's wrong except yourself. So you come out in your anti everything, you come out clean because morally speaking, you come out in a, in a pedestal as being a having the superior moral ground that everybody is wrong because you don't dirty your hands in politics. You keep your hands out of politics, but in doing that, you're leaving the status quo intact because you're not transforming the world. You're not taking any kind of political intervention into the world. You're just moralizing, preaching morals without understanding the materiality of where you're at and how to go from where you're at now to where you wanna go. So you don't get involved in those discussions. You just judge everybody as wrong, and then you are okay because you never dirty your hands into politics, but you are as reactionary as extreme right, as imperialists and the fascists, because you're leaving the, the status quo intact. You don't change the status quo. You leave it intact in your hyper-radicalism, you see? And so I, I call that a politics, a conservative right-wing politics with a hyper-radical rhetoric because they don't intervene in politics they leave the status quo intact. Then the third question is the question of imperialism. They have the idea that imperialism is over. Core periphery in the international division of labor is over. They have the idea that <clears throat> what exists is some kind of superpower out there that it, it operates in the international arena, but it doesn't what, what matter inside the nation state is explained only by who rules in the government, the policies of the government, and so on. They lose sight of the system of imperialism. How imperialism is not out there, it's inside. It's inside every country today, especially in the periphery of the world economy. Imperialism is inside. You cannot think of imperialism as something that is over there, that is just an external 
constrained, but what matters to explain what happened inside is the policies of X or Y government. This is why they fall into the trap of repeating the same narrative of <clears throat> imperialism about Venezuela or Evo Morales. They say, oh, it's the wrong government with the wrong policies, authoritarian, not democratic, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then they blame of the economic crisis of Venezuela today, not to the sanctions of imperialism, not to the economic military worries of imperialism, not to the economic blockade of imperialism. They blame the Maduro government for having wrong economic policy. Mm -hmm. This is nonsense. It's as if, imperial, as if imperialism did not exist. Mm -hmm. And it's not an accident that a lot of these people have been our followers of some of these people, okay, at least, are followers of Tony Negri, this Italian Marxist, uh, who has come with this book called Empire, which is basically a, a, a attacking the idea of imperialism, saying that capitalism is in a new stage where core periphery do not exist anymore, where, uh, you know, you have deterritorialized capital flows with no grounding in territory. So this thing about extractivist industries and stuff like that of the whole imperialism of controlling territories, states and countries is over. I mean, and, and this kind of nonsense this is a very Eurocentric Marxist, you know, writing this from Italy without knowing the realities of the global South and of the realities of 80%, 85% of humanity. I mean, this is uh, nonsense. And a lot of these people are reading this kind of theories and of course, Tony Negri, on top of denying the reality of imperialism, is also anti-state in this anarchist way. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not an accident that a lot of the people signing these documents are followers of the Tony Negri uh, vision, okay? And, and a lot of the so-called decolonials, you know, that are falling into these traps are a uh, repeating some of the nonsense thesis and, um, and putting the accent of everything into the policies of the state as any other developmentalist theories you will find in the right-wing economic theories, as if the problem of it, economic problems of the country is the policies of the state. This is nonsense. But, but you, you I, I, think, I think one of the weakness of, of the young decolonial theory is also that Many of them, and many of us, have been trained in the critique, not in the alternative. So if you have yes. only a critique, so <clears throat> obviously you don't think about an alternative, so you are not practical, you see? But if the question is, tell me how a transformation, a decolonial transformation <clears throat> should take place, then suddenly you're not talking about critique anymore. You're talking about a whole different ballgame. Yes. That is, you have to produce ideas of what the transformation is about and how do you get it done? And that is not an intellectual exercise. It's a political exercise. Yeah. It's an exercise that has to do with how you organize people, how you get them involved in their own transformation. And if you don't think about that and you're only in the critique, of course, then you end up being, you know, on this uh, level where you could criticize everybody without telling anybody how to move forward. Yeah, this is what I call the moralistic politics, where you're only criticizing yeah. from a pedestal, yeah. you know, where you are, you, 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 you're supposed to be, you know, the perfect critique because you never get involved in politics, therefore your <clears throat> ha hands never get dirty. Right. You have your, your hands clean from politics and then you come with this, you know, Olympus, uh, Mount Olympus critique to everybody, you know, I, I agree completely with you. I just use this term of the moralistic uh, versus the people who take seriously politics. For me, the policy is this practical aspects, you know, moralistic is people are just criticizing for the sake of criticizing with no political project, no practical consequences, yeah. no practical uh, uh, alternatives. And here is where I see this mo moral they do morals, they don't do politics, you see? And this is, in practice, they are not being complicit with the powers that be because they are complicit with the status quo. They never intervene to change the world, you know? And this is where I find them very reactionary in their hyper-radicalism. And, and here is where I think that, 
you know, basically what I want to uh, emphasize, this question about the state, this question about imperialism, this question about extractivist industry, this question about, um, um, you know, uh, the, doing policies versus doing, doing morals, okay? Mm -hmm. This is what led this group of people to fall into these traps of people who are intelligent, people who are well-read, people who are, it's not a matter of that. It's, that, it's a matter of their conceptual uh, categories. That is the, 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 the conceptual framework from where they depart is really very problematic. It's very corrupt but also because they are yeah. very Eurocentric, very colonial. But I, I think we should also see it in the context of when a decolonial theory develops, and we are only at the beginning of it, what we uh, explained in the first uh, session, then you will have all these people. Like the, the utopian socialists were in the early socialist movement, where they produced all kinds of utopian ideas because they didn't do practical politics. When right. Marx and Angus came in and tried to argue that philosophers have always you know f philosophized and thought about the world but it the problem is how to change the world you know that that is the second phase of the socialist movement and i think that is where the decolonial movement stands now that we have in this period people who knows how to criticize but doesn't know how to develop decolonial politics and that's not only in Latin America. So what I would suggest, Ramon, is our next session, take the same discussion from the global south to the global north. Yeah, let me say something before we finish, too. Yeah. Is that this is why today I prefer to call myself decolonial anti-imperialist, okay? Because even though it sounds redundant, because you're decolonial, it's implicit that you're supposed to be anti-imperialist, but given this debate, given that you have decolonial imperialists, I mean, as, uh, or decolonial colonials, I use this term to show the contradiction, but Enrique Dussel had corrected me and said, Ramon, don't stop saying they're decolonial colonials. They are really colonials because they, they step out of the bus, of the decolonial bus, they're, they step out of the bus and the decolonial bus continues. Just, they, they're now in the other side of the trenches, mm -hmm. shooting this way. They are on the side of imperialism, so you cannot call them anymore decolonial, mm -hmm. not even in this euphemistic way you're using. Mm -hmm. and, I, and this is Enrique Dussel telling me this, I think he's right. Mm -hmm. I use this as a, as a euphemistic way of calling the attention to these right, right. uh, corrupted decolonial groups, but Anyway, I, I think he's right in that the word decolonial do not apply the moment these people are taking side with imperialism. Mm -hmm. But I'm using this decolonial and imperialism because out of the school of Caracas forces us to take this stand because in the school, the colonial school of Caracas, it became very evident that you need to take side in a relation of power. You cannot stay neutral. Either you are with the anti-imperialist forces, you are with the imperialist forces. There's no middle ground. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the thing is that they pretend to be in the so-called neutral, in this pedestal beyond the contradiction of the world, as if they were neutral. But mm -hmm. when you have a rela an unequal relation of power, the moment you take a neutral position, you are playing in the hands of the most powerful. Yeah. Because they are the ones who benefit from living the situation and the status quo intact. And so the moment you take a position like they take, they are on the side of the imperialists because they are, in a sense, uh, attacking the victims of imperialism in a moment of conflict, you see, and claiming to be in a neutral position, not with this, not with that, when in fact you are with the other side because they are the most powerful and, and the, the ones who have the upper hand in, the, in this situation of oppression. Yeah. So uh, there's, uh, this is a false neutrality. These people are, in a sense, taking a side in the so-called neutrality. Mm -hmm. And so I, I now prefer to call myself decolonial anti-imperialist. Mm -hmm. Because that way, even though it's an oxymoron, even though it sounds redundant to say decolonial anti-imperialist, you're supposed to be anti-imperialist, you're decolonial, mm -hmm. it's not anymore 
a common sense given these debates happening in Latin America. Today we need to call yeah. it very clearly. Yeah. And I want to put the question of anti-imperialism there at the center because also I seen the same problem due that we see in these debates in Latin America among the colonial networks in Europe. And that's why we should take a special session, the next session to discuss it. Yes, because okay. I see, mm -hmm. I see to finish, I see also the colonial groups in Europe that are not taking seriously the question of anti-imperialism yes. against their own governments. Yes. That is the, and you could see that, for example, we could go in more detail next week, in, in networks inside Europe, for example, inside Spain, for example, where I see groups that take the anti-racist position, but they forget that they are in an imperial state called the Spanish state, and then they don't build a politics of transformation against that state. They stay in the anti-racist struggle, mm -hmm. and, and then in doing that, they lose sight of that the anti-racist struggle to be successful have to tackle the problem of state domination and imperialist domination in that territory. And, and that so is, that's and the topic for next week. Okay, great. Have a good day. All right. Thank you. Thank you.